Hey, beautiful people. So it stopped at Ephesians 5.33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Did not Adam forgive Eve? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Because he loved her as himself, going on to call her his bone of his bones, knowing she was made for him and out of him by God. And he could love no other like whom God made for him. That is why patience is required in fasting for your ordained spouse, for your marriage, for your engagement. So you will fulfill God's will for your life, your marriage, and your destiny with the correct spouse whom God made for you. And you'll be happy with a person perfectly designed by God for you, like he did for Adam and Eve. But by joint, but not literally, you're not going to have the same Adam Eve made out of you like Adam, but by joining you together in holy matrimony with your ordained spouse. For then, God blesses a man with favor and prosperity. When a man finds a wife, that's when God blesses him with favor and prosperity. Um, as you can see with Abraham, Isaac, Moses, um, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and the list goes on. Proverbs 18 and 22. Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing. So what does it tell you in Proverbs 18? Whosoever findeth a wife finds a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So when do you f obtain favor from God? When you find yourself a wife, when you're not shacking, when you're not playing the whorelet. Genesis 2 and 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. That is how deep it is. Now you're not yourselves. Your body is not your own because now you are one flesh with your wife. Now it tells you to love your wife as your body because we're going to go into the body part of marriage and the fornicate, the, you know, the love making of marriage and things that people invite into their marriages. So let's keep going. Genesis 6 and 18. But with thee I will establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So do you see how God established his covenant with Noah with his sons and his wife? Because that's why he says, leave your mother and your father's health and cleave to your wife because then a man will bless then God will bless you with favor and remember he children are a blessing from God he blesses your seed Genesis 12 and 1 now the Lord had said unto Abraham get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee I bet you guys better stay to the end because I'm about to get into some really heavy stuff <laughs> And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Do you see what God told Abraham? Leave your father's house, and he's going to show him a land. And he's going to make him a great nation, and he'll bless him and make him a great name. Favor. Blessings. When you leave your mother's house, and you, marry, you find yourself a wife. Favor. Blessings. Prosperity. It'll follow you. Because that's what God wants you to do. Genesis 24 and 40. And he said unto me, The Lord, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. That is what he did to Isaac. And okay, now let's talk about Adam and Eve's trials with children. Because um, there's going to be trials with your children in your marriage. What Will your marriage be able to withstand that? Are you going to love your wife as yourself? Are you going to love your husband as yourself? Are you going to stay through the tribulation? Now, Adam and Eve's trials with children, they endured in their marriage the loss of a child by the hands of their eldest child. Would you be able to stand by your partner or your spice through tragedies, through the loss of children, through loss, through affliction, through pain, through grief, through sorrows, through hardship, through difficulties, through tribulations, through chastenment, be through poverty, being rich or poor. Because Adam and Eve did suffer chastenment when they were thrown out the garden. Hardships, difficulties, pain, grief, and affliction and sorrows. Would you be able to stay with your partner naked or clothed, sick, blind, disabled, deaf, dumb, or even love your husband and your wife as Christ loved you in all these things. Because Christ loved you through your chastisement, your hardship, your difficulties, your sorrows, in your repentance, 
in your sickness, in your blindness, in your deafness, in your dumbness, in your disabilities. And, and God expects you to love your spouse with that same love that Christ has for you because he loved you in all things, just like God loves you in all things. That is the love God requires. And not only that, love is a commandment. Through all things like Adam and Eve did, they tilled the ground, they suffered hardship. They were kicked out of the garden. They suffered affliction, pain, grief, sorrow, sadness, loss, lack. Will you be able to stay with your partner if you lack, if you guys become poor? That's why it's 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 told to a husband to follow your wife. It's told to a wife to be there in everything with your husband. Be there through the trials, even with comforting your children and helping parenting your children. Now, how much did Adam love his wife? Genesis two and twenty three. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. And he stayed with her through thrown out of the garden of paradise and him eating the apple and causing him to sin. Not only did he love her, he forgave her. And we know those who forgive love God for he expects us to forgive for that is an act of love. And that is what Adam did. 1 John 4 and 16 and we have known and believed the love that God has to us God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him now John 15 and 13 greater love has no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends that is what Christ did for you that is the type of love God wants you to have for your wife and your husband willing to lay down your life to save your wife or your husband. That is the degree in which you should love your wife and your husband. For this is how Christ loved the church. 1 John 4 and 18. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So if you're not really willing to lay down your life for your love, that means you're you're not perfect in love because perfect love casts out fear. This wouldn't even be, you wouldn't even fear me saying this to you. Now, 1 John 4 and 18, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. See, love is an action word. Christ laid down his life for your sins because he loved you. 1 John 4 and 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also, we ought also to love one another. And not only that, it's a commandment now, a new one from Christ. 1 John 4 and 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. So how does your love be perfected in you when you dwell in God? That's why I said, if you don't love your creator, you can never love another man or a woman. Or you could never love your husband or wife the way that they're supposed to be loved. Like that Adam and Eve love. Um, Ephesians 5 and 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. All right? So we know that the husband is the head of the wife and Christ is the head of the church. All right? And Christ is the head of the husband. And he is the savior of the body. So... And now Ephesians 5 and 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. Now Ephesians 5 and 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wise be to their own husbands in everything. So subject to your husband in, Christ, in everything. That's what it says. Now respecting your husband, obeying him, Homemaking, you know, cook, clean, and washing, giving due belovedness, love making, etc. Your husband and having him lead, him being your head, him, him, him being above you. Yeah, when he is led by Christ, when he is led by Christ. If he's not led by Christ, he is not your head. No, he maybe maybe you're divorced, maybe you're widowed, maybe you're single. There is no husband to be your head. Therefore, Christ is your head. 
and your maker is your husband. Isaiah 54 and 5. For thy maker is thy husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall be, shall he be called. But if you have but if you have a husband, he is your head. But if you don't have a husband and you're widowed or you're singled, then Christ is your head. Now, it tells you love your wife as yourself. Now, let's talk about the body. Let's talk about lovemaking. Let's talk about how you carry yourself in your relationship and in your marriage and how God wants you to carry yourself with your body and do belovedness in your marriage. Ephesians 5 and 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Why does he tell you to love your wife as his own as your own body? Remember, in, in Ephesians 5 and 2, it says, Christ also loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. And Ephesians 5 and 24 tells us, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, what? You're supposed to love your wife as your own body. How do you love your own body? For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. Now, Adam loved his wife as his own body. He called her bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. Your body is not your own when you are married. You're one flesh with your partner. And look, and they were Genesis 2 and 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. You're not supposed to be ashamed of your husband or your wife or their nakedness. Because God made that for a man and a woman. Now, Ephesians 5 and 30, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. That's talking about Christ. And it says that Christ is the head of the husband, at the head of the church, and the head of the husband, and the, the husband is the head of the wife. And it says, we are members of his body. So we, and it tells the wife, the husband to love his wife as his own body. And then it goes on to tell you, for no man ever had hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it even as the Lord, the church. So you're supposed to nourish and cherish your body and your wife's body because now you guys are one flesh. Now let's keep going because this is now what's going to get deeper. We're going to talk about soul tides and things a little bit about that. Now, how do we know that? Nevertheless, Ephesians 5 and 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular slow love his wife even as his self, himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. John 15 and 9, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. That is how God wants you to love your husband and wife. Now, you know it's a commandment. This is my commandment, John 15 and 12, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, Colossians 3 and 19, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So it's even telling you, don't be bitter to them. Forgive them and love them. Ephesians 5 and 28, so all men, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Now, we got to keep going. Let's talk about the soul ties. 1 Corinthians because you're, you're one flesh now. 1 Corinthians 7 and 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due beloveds. Likewise also the wife unto the husband. That means you guys don't deprive each other from lovemaking. A um, husband is supposed to render unto the wife the due beloved. Loved, do belovedness just likewise as the wife to her husband. He's not supposed to be seeking whorlets and she's not supposed to be seeking men. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You understand you are not your own because we are members of Christ's body and we are, and you and your wife are one flesh. And your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. That is why you're not supposed to have many wives. 
Just because it was done doesn't mean it wasn't right. Fast and take it up with God. Because we got a lot of people preaching polygamy. But I'm going to discredit you. And I'm going to prove it through scriptures. And then I want your scriptures to back it up. Because just because things were done doesn't mean they were right. And God wants me to explain that to you. Ephesians 5 and 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. Now Matthew 19 and 5. And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twine shall be one flesh. Now you're one flesh with your wife. Wherefore, they are no more twine, but one flesh. Therefore, what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Because you can get STDs sleeping around. You can get soul ties and spirit ties. There's, a, there's two, soul ties and spirit ties are two different things. And flesh ties and privy part ties because people do a whole bunch of enchantments. Hebrews 13 and 4. Marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So people who are having sex outside of marriage, God is going to judge you because you're considered a whoremonger and an adulterer before him. That is why he tells you to get a wife. 1 Corinthians 6 and 16. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for two says he shall be one flesh so it tells you when you're sleeping outside of wedlock now your body is joined with a harlot and you're one flesh with a harlot whatever whoever she's sleeping with it whoever he's sleeping with it whoever whatever soul ties and spirit ties that person is carrying now they're carrying it now, that's why it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Why? Because you're going to catch spirit ties, soul ties, and you become one flesh with the whore, as 1 Corinthians 6 and 16. Now, Proverbs 6 and 32, but whosoever, and not only, this is what, why it tells, God tells a husband to love his wife as his self, because <clears throat> you can catch soul ties, spirit ties, and you're one flesh with your wife. And when you sleep around, you're now one flesh with a whorelet. Now, Proverbs 6 and 32, and not only that, it is against his commandments. And, and this is a punishment. This is something that people lack when they commit adultery. It says, but whoso commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that does it destroys his own soul. So what happens when people commit adultery? They lack understanding. So people who commit adultery, they lack understanding. They don't know they lose blessings. They won't prosper. They won't get finances and wealth. Because God doesn't bless shacking. And, and you destroy your own soul. And Leviticus 20 and 10. And the man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So that is of the law. And Christ told you he never came to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And that is why you have remission of sin. So if you committed adultery, you should repent. Because not only do you destroy your own soul, you lack understanding. And not only that, God's judgment for adulterers and adulteresses is that they should be put to death. In Leviticus 10, 20 and 10. Matthew 25 and 35. For I was... Uh, now let's talk about being with your wife through all things and telling and because he said you're supposed to love your wife as christ loved the church right now how did christ love the church matthew 25 and 35 for i would let's talk about it because this is how god wants you to judge to love your wife and your husband for i was a hungry and you gave me meat feeding them i was thirsty and you gave me drink and i was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me i was sick and you visited me so clothing your your husband and wife taking care of them when they're sick i was in prison if they go to prison you visit them and you came on to me then shall the righteous answer him saying lord when saw we thee a hungry and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? 
or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now Ephesians 5 and 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Do you understand that you're supposed to have loving your wife as your own body? Ephesians 5 and 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5 and 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, we're going to go into Ephesians 5 and 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That means don't be sleeping around with other men. Have your own husband. For the husband is the head of the wife. And we got into that. So that is what I want you guys to understand with marriage. Marriage is deep. And we're going to talk about polygamy because just because things were done doesn't mean they were right. And they were going to go about Israel. Israel was deceived. He was in love with Rachel. And Laban gave him Leah. Just because things were done doesn't mean they were right. But that is for another video. Because we're going to talk about polygamy. And that they've been teaching false doctrine. False doctrine. And they'll go for Moses and they'll go for Israel, but they don't understand that God gives you a free will. And when people make bad decisions, you come out of the destiny of God that God ordained for your free for for your destiny. When you abuse your free will, when you make the wrong decisions, you change your story. Just like what happened with Saul. God made Saul the king of Israel. He went to the witch of Endor and God took him away from being the king of Israel. And he got David, a man of his own heart. You can change your story by your own free will. When Judah met Tamar, the whorelet, and slept with her, was she his ordained spouse from God? No, she was not. She was not. Bad decisions, free will. Your own free, you abusing your own free will can change your story and change your destiny. And when you repent, God will change your story. But it doesn't mean that is what God ordained for you. And that is what people need to understand. And they need to take that up with God. Because a lot of things have been, destinies have been diverted and changed in the Bible because of people's decisions. Just like Reuben being the firstborn, he lost his firstborn blessing when he slept with his dad's wife, with his dad's concubine. 